So you'd like to go inside the studio with Alison McCormack. Well, you're in the right place. I'm Helen Miles and I'm here to teach you all the tips and tricks you need to make mosaics. For those of you who don't know Alison McCormack, I would suggest that you go and look her up now. Alison is completely extraordinary for three main reasons. One is her use of colour and connected to that is her handling of tonality. And the third is how she uses Mexican Smalty. Uh, so Mexican Smalty is this, ex it's lovely, essentially. It is a kind of Smalty, obviously, but it's very different from the Italian variety. So watch this video and find out all about the materials and all about Alison's practice inside her studio. Can we just start off by um, you telling us about how you get how you got started as a mosaicist? Oh yeah, great. I uh, first discovered mosaic in the last few weeks of art college. When, uh, I studied stained glass at art college and so I was in love with stained glass. I consider myself a glass artist so I wanted to work in stained glass, really, really liked it. Um, and I came back and lived, I lived in Ireland uh, after that and I worked in a stained glass studio and I did actually make some mosaics at that time. I made three or four mosaics. I made a shop front that was in, I did use Winkleman. And then I had a big gap of about 20 years and then since, wait with family and everything. And then I got back into it in around 2019. I got, a, a, well, 2017 actually, I got a commission to do a sign and I thought oh I, uh, I could either um, you know, pay a, a printing company to make a sign or I could make one myself from mosaic so that's what I did and I used stained glass at that time and then I got a bigger commission and I, I did a lot of research looking at different um, mosaic materials you could use to make um, to make mosaics and on Online, I saw this amazing stuff, um, which I discovered as Mexican smelty, and that was it. Uh, because, as I, as I said, I am I do consider myself a glass artist, and handmade glass was always uh, love of my life. And so now I have, I was into, used to be into transparent glass with the stained glass, but now I opaque, you know, and it just does it for me. Um, so you said you just discovered Mexican smalty. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about that? How you discovered it, and what is it? What is it about Mexican smalty that appeals to you? I actually I found the work of an American artist called Dixie Friend Gay, and she has a fantastic website and really nice images. And I was looking at these pictures, and because I was familiar with me with Italian smalty. I knew that what I was looking at wasn't Italian smalty and I, find, I, I knew I was looking at something amazing and I just had to find out what it was. So I got the name of it and then I contacted the company because I didn't really know any other way of getting it and they're in Mexico so I buy it, uh, uh, mostly I buy it directly from them. Great company, really nice to deal with and um, yeah, just fell in love. Uh, for me, uh, making art has always been about my relationship with the material and I just get excited by it. I just can't help it. I love looking at it. I love touching it. I, it's just, it's just the way that it is, you know. <laughs> and how would you describe your practice? Uh, yeah, I, I, the imagery in in my in my art, the 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 subject matter that I use tends to fall into three categories. Uh, one would be nature, whether it's flowers or leaves or or the, the natural world around me and f uh, figures i'm really interested in, in in figures and the the sort of light and dark shading that you get and um and as well as doing portraits i, I like doing quick drawings of of people and, and, and using them and then also a surface pattern i actually thought i might be a, a, i've moved into the surface pattern uh, designer area at one point but i actually find that it, it's the fact that i like drawing pattern i really i really I just enjoy doing that. So those three elements are what I like to draw. And the way that I make my art is I usually draw from life. I mean, sometimes you can't if you I did an artwork with a bird in flight. So I had, had to draw from a picture of a bird. But where possible, I would draw from the real thing. It's night and day for me in terms of the, mm. the quality of, of my drawings. And then 
I would translate those drawings into uh, in, into uh, mosaic. The the other element that's really really important to me is color combination and. It, it's just every piece of mosaic I put out has a very particular uh, colour combination. It, it's, it's what, it, it's in my head from the beginning and I know the kind of general colours it's going to be and it's it's not a case of doing a, a, a green artwork, it, it's just how, how they bounce off each other, the lights, the darks, the tones, the, the different shading. So all those are in there and in the mix when it comes to making um, a finished artwork. And do you have a particular fabrication method that you prefer with your mosaics? Um, the best answer I can give to that is that at, at present they're varied. They're, they're not meant to be, and I feel I'm actually pushing towards a particular method at the minute, but that's come through experimentation. Uh, for example, the first big mosaic I did, I, I knew it was indoors, but I wanted to, and I knew I could have made it with, with wood glue and um, it would have been fine, but I wanted to develop a method that I could use externally. So when, when the time came that I got um, an external commission that I would, that I would know what I was doing and it would all be, it would be, you know, everything would stay in place. And so I treated it as such. And that time I worked on, on the sticky back plastic and I, with Mexican smell tape, the big thing is you can't do it in reverse because it's so different on each side so it's just it's just not possible so i had to do this kind of double flip thing so i put it on one sticky back plastic and then i put an even the even stickier plastic on the the front side and then i peeled off the plastic that, that was on the back and it, it, it did work it was a bit hairy i have a table that i can lift up to the vertical so I it has hinges on it so I hinged it up and I did a big flip and it, it did it did manage to transfer there's a, each one is technically different so I kind of moved away from plastic and then I moved on to um, wood glue uh, sorry not wood glue uh, flour and water paste with the on the brown paper and I actually find that that quite good but again what I was doing was because of the fact I had to do it and I call it double reverse I have to work on it face up and then make a kind of a, a mosaic and brown paper sandwich where you've got brown paper, mosaic, brown paper, and then you you remove the side that you were originally working on, if, if that makes sense. It took ages. It was really, really slow. And I had the pieces up in the shower cubicle upstairs. It was just, it, it just, I'm doing it because I was stuck doing it in the process. That was for the foxglove one but I knew I wasn't gonna do it that way again. So my most recent way that I've, that I've developed is I use this um, super duper uh, epoxy grout called, called uh, care epoxy, mappy uh, care epoxy. And what I do is I do the mosaic on brown paper, uh, fa face up. Using flower paste. Using, yeah, using yeah. Um, flower paste. And then I effectively grout it with the care epoxy. And while it's still on the while paper. it's still on the brown paper, yeah, uh -huh. and actually it it works fine. So you end up with this layer of, of, of mosaic that's just the mosaic tiles, and the reason and then it, it's actually so, quite so, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But so so when it sets, it's solid. You mean it, it as is like a single? Yeah. It's a single piece. It, it uh -huh. makes it like a bigger piece piece of tile, I suppose. Yeah. Now it's not strong in the sense that you could chuck it around the place, but. It just needs to stay that way till you get it onto the either the Ouija board or if you, you could just put it straight in a wall if you wanted. And I, I just find it great. I've only done that for the last panel. That was the the uh, community mosaic of the community brain that I did. And it I really like it. And I think that's the way I'm going to go forward for commissions that go uh, in a public place where you want them grouted. That's, um, the, you know, or outdoors or whatever. And yeah, I, re I really think it's a good it's a good way and it saves the whole flipping and the mosaic and brown paper sandwich business, which was very slow. Uh, so that's the way I'm doing my bigger commissions. Um, well, there was something you were saying about carapoxy, about how you like to use it because it it's shiny. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. the, I find with Mexican smelty, it, but smelty, it's nice and shiny. And I found that the the normal grout just deadened everything it just, just sucked life out of it or something so but this is as shiny as the glass and i just think that this, they're much more compatible together and that that technique i described by the way works particularly well because mexican smalty is an even more or less six millimeter thick 
and because of the way that it's manufactured differently from Italian smelting, I don't think it would be as effective with Italian smelting. It's, it's, it, the, the other thing is I like my mosaics to be nice and flat and it, it gives you that flatness when, 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 when it's finished and I, I do like that. Uh, but the other way I've been working on my smaller pieces is I been doing them on sticky back plastic and then you I end up with them with the front with this the sticky back plastic on the front of the mosaic now this would work with brown paper as well it would be fine and then I just put the care epoxy down and I just squash it into the the care epoxy and then fingers crossed if it's a nice even thickness and it's not too thick it doesn't come squeezing up through the gaps because I actually think for pieces like the portrait that I did and the smaller pieces it's nicer if the if it's not grouted and it's got that little distance of even just a couple of mil between what would be the adhesive and the and the top of the smelting, it just gives it a bit more life, a bit more flicker, a bit more um, interest. So I, that's the way I'm doing for my smaller exhibition pieces. So actually with that method, what you're doing is putting it on the less sticky, sticky back plastic and then putting the, as you were describing earlier, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, more, yeah, yeah. the more the one that the sticky back plastic you, that you buy in a roll from mosaic suppliers, whereas the other sticky is the one that you would buy from maybe a school book covering supplier. Yeah. And, so you're sticking it onto the school book covering first. First, yeah. and then putting. I think it's called tile tiler's tape, the the really thick heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, that's how it's actually sold in uh, building suppliers. But mm -hmm. yeah. And another element of the fabrication is when I'm making my work, I, I like to stand at a distance and look at it from a distance, as, as a lot of people do. And that can be hard sometimes. So one, when I mentioned about having all these different ways of making mosaics, one of them, I, I worked with it up on the vertical and I actually just stuck the, the pieces down with, with glue and they, they stayed on. But it was quite slow because you can imagine some of them kind of began to fall down and, and you have to keep hold of them till the glue stayed and it and it was it was slow but it was brilliant to be able to see the artwork uh, from a distance and, and vertical it was, it was really nice idea I did, I did made the foxglove in that way for example sorry to interrupt but what kind of glue was that oh that was uh helen miles recipe uh flour and water paste glue and it, it worked. i actually i used print stick at first but it didn't need, i found i didn't need to use print stick the the flour and water paste was perfect so and it was on to um I actually, yeah, it was onto a paper, which it was a bit, it ended up being a bit of a pain to remove it off the back. So I won't be doing that again. I'm always cha changing ways. So the, I'm kind of still thinking of, oh, the other thing about working on it vertical was it was really good for my back. It did, didn't hurt my back at all. It was really nice body position to work. So I, I'm not so good on the bench. I kind of, you're not at dis you're not the right distance away. And so what I do now is when I'm on the bench, I have a big long, a big step ladder. So I go up the top of that and there's nice high ceilings in here. So I go up the top of that and I look down. That helps, but it's still not as good as if the thing's on the vertical. So what I'm thinking of doing, there's also on the ceiling here, a big um, RSG beam. So I'm thinking of rigging up some kind of pulley system that I can pull the tabletop up. So if I'm working on the bench, I can I can kind of pull it up to have a look at it or or maybe sometimes work on it on the vertical sometimes work it on the flat but that these are all next steps uh, once you know as, as i develop the studio and do you have a particular working method a uh, strategy when you start making a mosaic um yeah i i'm really into an and i'm always i'm always thinking about it and uh, when i first started back at mosaics um a few years ago i was I really thought that the only way I could do it was to follow the the Roman method, and I you know I was familiar with those, and I, and I did those, and but then I don't know if it's because I'm using Mexican smelty and the shapes of the pieces are different. It didn't quite align. So now what I do is I I actually I, it's just as I go along. So some parts are done very much with the 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 Roman method. So say for example the way you might outline around an object with the the line in the background with the same colour in the background. So I might outline some lines, but that doesn't mean in the, in the whole piece that I feel I have to like outline every single one. And I think that, so for example, again, back to the Fox Club, I would have outlined some of the bits of the flowers, but not others. And it, I think it, for me personally, I think it gives it much more life. There's a kind of an in out thing that happens. Some of them come forward, some of them go back uh, with, with, with that difference. And I, and I do think Mexican smelting is a material. You don't need to be so 
possibly re rigid with it maybe um so when this happens I, I don't know i don't plan what part i'm, I'm going to do in particular ways it's just as i'm doing i get a feeling and it just that's the way that i, I run with it and uh, and then the most recent work i've been doing i've been playing around with andamento again and and turning it into slightly more patterned uh, and cutting it out and using the same size pieces to do slightly different things so that's another new exciting uh, direction that i'm going in uh, just just discovering it at the minute and can you tell us about the first big commission that you undertook? Oh, yeah, uh, that was a Percent for Art project uh, that I did in Maryland, um, Maryland Wood School for a, a primary school, a national school over here. And they, the, the brief was, was, 10, uh, was their 10 year anniversary. So my theme was that I chose 10 different native uh, plants and they were within the, uh, the work. And it's a horizontal work. and. It moves from left to right through from spring to summer, autumn and, and, and winter with the different things that are happening at those times of year for the plants. But it was a really hard uh, design to come together. I did the drawings and I then that was fine. That was the easy bit. But then I had to put them all together. It, it was it was hard. I, I used the computer actually to uh, Photoshop's really good for pulling things like that together. But when I was actually making the piece, one of the the things that I, that I had to consider was the tone, the light and the dark. So I had to have each, say there was a, a, the, the hawthorn, it, it had to be, I think it, I think it's little frondy bits were, they, oh actually the, it was a hip, a rose hip, it's little frondy bits were light against a dark background and then other parts were dark against a light background and it took an awful lot of working out and in fact I made, I did a really nice Scots pine branch, pine tree branch and then I realised that it was all dark and I realised it was just going to completely merge into the background because it was dark against dark. So I actually spent two days redoing it um, in a lighter in a lighter glass. So that, that's the kind of thing. <laughs> but I learned a lot. So now I know if I'm doing it again, I'll be really, before I even begin to, you just get carried away and you're, and you're making the thing. But now I'm, I'll be, I'm much more careful now that I'm, I think about that tonal tonality of the, of the final piece and what, Basically, what's the background and, and the foreground, uh, colours and the, the, the light and darkness of them. The way you talk about your work, I get the impression you're very particular about lots of aspects of it, the colour and the andamento and, and the laying. So is there anything you, you would, I mean, you'd like to change or you think uh, you want to develop in your work? <laughs> I do think I should try and speed up. I, re I really do. And especially actually working alongside yourself because I, I can't believe it. You're flying along and I'm still on something about the size of a postcard or smaller. And it it, it is difficult because I know how, how I could make it to look so nice. But on the other hand, I find if you put pieces down too carefully, they can look really sort of still and staid and, and just a lack of movement in them. And I actually think if you put them down quicker, it can make a much better mosaic. That the, the, they're lively, that the, there's a movement, there's a life. And for example, the Boris Anrep uh, figures and, and faces in the National Museum and in, in uh, the National Gallery in London are incredible. And and they they have to have been done quickly. They're, 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 the pieces are just all at jaunty angles, but it, they're incredibly successful. And I just I would like to push my art in a way to just move a bit faster. I mean, I think I have to, I have to start moving faster, but it's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> and can you tell us about your space? Um, when did you move here? And, and would you, how can you, how would you describe it? I can consider myself very, very lucky. I'm actually really excited about my, my space. We moved to this house in 1999 and there was sheds. It's, it's a farmhouse in Ireland and they, they often, if you buy a house in the country in Ireland, it comes with sheds and it used to be a cow barn and we, it was actually filled with the, the, the evidence of cows when we moved here. That was one of the first jobs we did. We shoveled it, <laughs> shoveled it all the way. So we, it was always going to be my studio set, shed uh, way back, but um. But I was, as I mentioned before earlier with family, I just didn't get around to making much art. So they, we, when we did it up, we put in a wooden floor and we insulated it really well. Um, and it ha actually has lovely high ceilings. It's got really nice light in the evening. It's north facing. Um, it could, it's north facing. So the wind, at this time of day, the light comes in beautiful. 
And the reason why I'm excited is because my husband actually was using it for a storage for something. So there was a middle wall and the space I was using was quite small. Uh, but a few weeks ago, because Helen Miles was coming, we decided to knock the wall down and it's I've doubled it in space and uh, it's just amazing. I'm really, I'm really, really lucky. It's a brilliant space to work. I, I can have two huge tables. So there's the space. I even want to put my little exercise machine in the corner. So if I'm getting feeling a bit sleepy, I can go and do some stretches and there's loads of room for lots of different things. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. There's two windows facing down into a kind of a valley down into this field at the back. There's quite often horses in the field and there's lovely views out, out the other windows. And oh, the other good thing about it is it's just a quick, uh, just about just eight steps from the house, um, from out the kitchen. So that's really handy as well. You've got some amazing materials here and lots and lots of bits and pieces. Can you tell us a little bit about how you organise your materials and how you store things? Yeah, well, I, again, I was very lucky because because my husband had been using the shed for storage, there was these really good shelves that he had put up from inch thick MDF. So they're really strong. So on one side of the shed, I have all my Mexican smelty and it's all I have it coded into what it, the, the, the code numbers that, that it comes from uh, the company. And but that and that's tends to be color coordinated as well. So that's all on one side. And then on the other side, which is behind me here, I have general mishmash and the, the wall was only knocked down there a few weeks ago, so that still needs all tidied, but plenty, plenty space. And in terms of my mosaic, I'm really particular about keeping the colour in the right boxes. I, I just really don't like it when the colours, when, when the wrong kinds of mosaics or pieces are mixed together. I, I just, I, so sometimes I spend hours sorting them all out after a job, but hey, it's just the way that I like to do it. <laughs> and and it's funny because I'm not a particularly tidy person, but when it comes to organising the, the mosaic tiles into their correct colours, I'm really pretty fanatical about that. And I also have a cupboard, an old wooden cupboard, which I keep all my drawing stuff in. And there's, that needs to be a little tidy as well. Lot, lots to be done in the tidy department in the shed. Uh, I call it the shed. I just can't bring myself to even call it the studio. It's just, it's just. I'm going out, out to the shed. <laughs> I don't know what people imagine when I say that, but it's a really nice uh, example of a of a shed stroke studio. It sounds like a great setup, but is there anything you'd like to change? There is one big thing I really need to change. Is I, I'm actually working in the half of the shed that doesn't have any electric light, so it's obviously not ideal uh the it's fine in, in the summertime now the sun's coming in the window that's grand but i, I will need to fix uh, give myself better light it was always kind of dark in here but what i was i was uh speaking to someone and they were telling me you can get these lights that's daylight bulb now i do have a daylight bulb lamp but you can apparently get your whole lighting done up with, with daylight bulbs so i'm going to get that done we're going to get an electrician in get that done because it's really obviously <laughs> important to be able to see and I do find being so involved in the colour and using colour to uh, to make my work, it, it, if I don't have, if I can't see the colours properly, it, it's just weird. The minute the sun goes down, they just change and you, you don't get the same sense of them. So, uh, yeah, good lighting. Is, uh... um, do you have any particular advice for new mosaicists, people that are just starting out on their mosaic journey? Uh, yeah, I think a really important piece of advice is... Uh, uh, join a mosaic community, f find other people that make mosaics. The, 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 I actually think, I don't know if it's the same for all other art forms, but the mosaic community is incredibly supportive. People are, are very, very helpful. There's all sorts of technical uh, information and details that people are, are happy to share with you. And I actually think in terms of the mosaic community, I think the way that people do mosaics for different parts of the, the world. You know, there's a call out, for example, to Rachel Sager's things and everybody sends off Beehive mosaics. And it, it, it's just really, it's really nice. And people can build up connections. So even jo join um, your local mosaic society, if there is one and and, and just and, and, and meet and talk. Uh, mosaic artists love chatting. And uh, so yeah, definitely that's that would be an important bit of advice. And uh, another thing is do your research into the, the materials that you're going to use in, in particular the adhesives the grouts the substrates figure out what what works for you and especially if you're doing commissions that are external make sure you're using the, ring, the right thing ask get get in touch with the um the the technical people who are over the product um just 
do your homework because you really don't want to be using the wrong thing. It, 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 the mosaics, they can have a tendency to fall to pieces and it, it's, yeah, it's just, obviously that's not good for anybody. And for people who want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do it? Uh, yeah, I have a website, uh, which is alisonmccormick.com and the, I'm also quite active on Instagram, which is Alison McCormick Mosaics. I don't use Facebook, I just, online is one is enough for me to go with. And McCormick at yahoo.ie. Well, thank you very much, Alison. It's really interesting and great to talk to you. <music>